Chief Justice Michael Pang, to Justice Sir Richard Field, to our distinguished digital colleagues from Shanghai, and to each of you to this our echo to our fourth um, lecture series of 2015 uh, about the Chinese legal system. As you know, uh, we've been working closely with our judicial colleagues in Shanghai. Uh, I can tell you it's an extraordinary judicial system. It's incredibly advanced, which is what you'd expect from a technology point of view, but also has many new initiatives, including the use of mediation to settle large-scale commercial disputes, from which certainly we can learn uh, a great deal. I'll introduce Chief Justice Michael Huang, who will then in turn introduce the President of Shanghai's Maritime Court and the Head of the Delegation from Shanghai, uh, President Zhao. Chief Justice Michael Huang graduated from Oxford and was a former law teacher at the University of Sydney and the University of Singapore. He was a, in private practice. He was a partner with Singapore's largest law firm, Allen and Gledhill, where he ran the litigation and arbitration department for 10 years. He served as a, the equivalent of a high court judge in the Supreme Court of Singapore. And um, he was appointed in 1997 as one of Singapore's first 12 senior counsels. Chief Justice Frank is a member or was a member of the American Law Institute and has been a visiting professor at the National University of Singapore. He served as a commissioner to the United Nations Compensation Commission based in Geneva and was appointed Chief Justice of the course in June 2010, having served as Deputy Chief Justice pretty much since we started in April 2005. Last year, Chief Justice Huang was appointed head of the DIFC's Dispute Resolution Authority, and in the same year, he was bestowed an honorary degree of Doctor of Laws by the University of Sydney. I invite Chief Justice Michael Huang to come up and introduce President Zhao. Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to our fourth lecture of 2015, and our first under the auspices of the new Academy of Law. Most of you here are familiar with the Academy, when it was part of the DIFC courts. Um, and you will recall the programs that were undertaken by the Academy prior to the Academy being formally uh, established by statute uh, last year when the DRA was formed. So all the old programs uh, of the old Academy have now been transferred to the new uh, Academy. Uh, its core functions include uh, training and regulating lawyers, publishing court reports and academic literature. Uh, we have a few uh, projects in the pipeline already. Providing free legal advice for people in need uh, through the region's first pro bono program and hosting events such as this lecture series that help to develop the rule of law, the legal system and the professional community of the UAE. We are now shifting the academy into a higher gear, and to that end, we have appointed a full-time director, David Gallo, uh, whom I'm pleased to introduce to you today. He's sitting there in the second row. Uh, David Gallo is uh, a qualified lawyer in the United States, uh, began his career as corporate counsel before moving into very senior operational and managerial roles with companies in the United States, United Kingdom, UAE, and Saudi Arabia. And I now look forward to working closely with David and his team as we develop this important new resource uh, for the UAE legal community. I'm also very pleased uh, to welcome tonight uh, Sir Richard Field, uh, a relatively new appointment to our uh, CFI, uh, our DIFC course bench. Uh, Sir Richard uh, was <coughs> former head uh, of the Commercial Court in London, uh, and on his retirement, he was, uh, we were delighted to be able to persuade him uh, to join our bench. So, Sir Richard, uh, since not many of uh, our members here present tonight uh, have actually seen you, perhaps you could just stand up and present yourself to the uh, audience. So, Sir Richard, feel and uh, some of you will be seeing him more often uh, in the months to come. Now, the first official act of the Academy of Law underscored the relevance of this evening's lecture.
part of the Academy's mission is to work with leading law schools around the world. And the first one we established formal ties with was not in Europe or the US, but in China. And we have established an MOU with the prestigious East, Uni East China University of Political Science and Law uh, in Shanghai, uh, where coincidentally our visitors tonight come from. Now, why do we do this? The answer is because China is Dubai's number one trading partner. And given the exceptionally strong commercial ties between the UAE and China, it's essential that the legal communities in both countries are equally well connected. Now, helping to achieve this is tonight's speaker, Ms. Zhao Hong, senior judge, president, and member of the Judicial Committee of the Shanghai Maritime Court. Senior Judge Zhao used to work as the presiding judge of the number four civil division of the Supreme People's Court hearing foreign related cases. For those lawyers who have an international law practice that impacts uh, into China, they are very familiar with number four court of the Supreme People's Court. It is the court that handles all of the foreign cases that need to be dealt with by the Supreme Court, including uh, enforcement and setting aside of foreign arbitration awards. So it is a very important court and the eyes of the world are typically on that court. And we are very uh, blessed tonight to have such an experienced international judge, the senior judge Zhao, to come and speak to us uh, tonight. She has also served as the director of the Office for Hong Kong, Macau and Taiwan Judicial Affairs of the Supreme People's Court. Now as a representative of that court, she has attended drafting and amendment projects for international conventions, including the UN Convention on Contracts for the International Carriage of Goods by Sea, the International Convention on the Removal of Wrecks, the Convention on International Interests in Mobile Equipment, and the Convention for the Suppression of Unlawful Acts Against the Safety of Maritime Navigation. It's now my privilege to hand over to Senior Judge Chow, who will give us a unique insight into China's legal landscape. Judge Chow. Honorable Chief Justice Michael Huang, Ms. McBear, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Thank you, Chief Justice Michael Huang, for inviting me to make a speech here, sharing judicial experience and exchanging the views and ideas with the local legal community in Dubai. It's my great honor. I know the time is much limited and very long, so I try my best to speak in English. In recent years, China has been engaged in the reform of the judicial system, and we are eager to learn and absorb useful experience from the fruitful achievements of different judicial civilizations, including that of UAE. I would like to take this opportunity to give you a general picture of Chinese court for better understanding and mutual trust. I hope this visit will lay a solid foundation for our future communication and cooperation in judicial fields. Today, my speech covers four parts. Firstly, I will introduce Chinese court system and its function. Secondly, I will address the ongoing process of China's judicial reform. The third part of my speech is about the court development in the age of information. And lastly, I will share with you the practice of specialized adjudication and its innovation. I'm going to the first part, Chinese court system and its function. According to the provisions of the Constitution of People's Republic of China and the organic law of the People's Courts, the court system of the People's Republic of China consists of the Supreme People's Court, 
the local people's calls at various levels and the specialized people's calls. The Supreme People's Court is the highest adjudicative organ of China. It's located in Beijing, the capital city of China. The local people's courts consist of the high people's courts, the intermediate people's court, and the primary people's courts. The high people's courts are the courts at the level of province, autonomous regions, and municipalities directly at the central government. The intermediate people's courts are set up at the level of prefectures and autonomous prefectures within province and autonomous regions, as well as prefecture level cities and municipality directly at the central government. The primary people's courts are set up in the counties, cities, autonomous counties, banners of county level, and the districts and the municipalities. The primary, the primary people's courts are responsible for hearing civil, criminal, and administrative cases of first instance, unless the case is under the jurisdiction of the Supreme People's Court. The High People's Court or Intermediate People's Court upon law. When the judgment or order of first instance is made, a party may bring an appeal only once to the People's Court at the nice higher level. A judgment or order of the court of the second instance shall be seen as the final decision of the case. In the world, Chinese court system can be characterized as four levels and judgment and or and the judgment of the second instance as final. Besides, for the party's interest of the convenience, primary people's cause and the specialized people's cause may establish dispatch tribunals in places where the cause have jurisdiction. The Supreme People's Court can set up circuit tribunals nationwide. Dispatch tribunal dispatch tribunals and the circuit tribunals are not individual courts. They are adjudicative divisions of the courts. They hear and decide cases in the name of the cause they belong to. The Chinese courts are also responsible for enforcement of the judgments and the verdicts. The enforcement shall be exercised by cause of first instance. The specialized people courts consist of military courts, the maritime courts, the railway transportation costs and the intellectual property costs. The maritime costs are equivalent to intermediate level people's costs in terms of the organizational system. And the hands that it gets dissatisfied with maritime cost judgments may appeal to the high people's cause. As president of Shanghai Maritime Court, I'm going to address more on the maritime cause. China's maritime cause was established in 1984 to meet the requirement of the fast development of foreign trade and ocean transportation of the adoption of the reform and opening up policies. There are two maritime calls nationwide. Spreading along the east coastline and Yangtze River in China. Different from local people's calls, maritime calls jurisdictional areas are defined by coastlines and the water areas rather than administrative areas. 
the subject matter jurisdiction of maritime courts covers three categories. The first is to contractual maritime disputes, including contracts of carriage of goods by sea, marine insurance contracts, charters, ship sales contracts, and seamen's employment contracts. The second is maritime tort disputes, such as ship collisions, compensation for maritime personal injuries or deaths and oil linkage damages. The third is special maritime proceedings, which cover the establishment of fund of limitation of liability for maritime claims, ship rights and the maritime injunctions. Maritime courts exercise exclusive jurisdiction over the above mentioned cases. The total number of judges in China is 200,000 judges in China. Last year, 15,650,000 cases were heard. The second part, ongoing in judicial reform process. Since the overall social economic development and the implementation of the fundamental principle of governing the country in accordance with the law, the public's, the public's awareness of the importance of the rule of law has been remarkably enhanced. Due to the pro profound changes in the judicial environment, the Supreme People's Court released a five-year plan of judicial reform in 1999, 2005, and 2009, respectively, carrying out a series of reform measures in an orderly and radio way to ensure judicial activities consistent with the rule of law and to promote judicial impartiality, efficiency, efficiency, and transparency. The first five-year plan of judicial reform centered on the restriction of powers by realizing the separation of case filings, filing, trial, and enforcement, reinforcing the functions of Collegial panels, strengthening the functions of the courtroom trial, strengthening and re strengthening the reasons of written judgments, and setting up popular popularized, standardized, and modernized dispatch tribunals. The second five-year plan of judicial reform focused on improving the adjudication committee promoting judicial openness, improving the trial proceeding management system and the trial quality supervision and review system, and reforming and improving the system of people's assessors. The third five-year plan of judicial reform included optimizing the allocation of the functions and the powers of the people's cause, implementing the criminal policy of temporal justice with mercy, reforming the judge recruitment and the judge welfare, boosting the cause information development and establishing a multiplied dispute resolution mechanism. Now China is under a new round of judicial reform different from the previous three, five-year plan, which centered on trial mechanism reform, the new reform focused on judicial institutional reform, among which four most important aspects are covered. First is to establish a staff management system, which is consist with the judicial professional characteristics. And, and the, the new court staff management system, court staff shall be divided into three categories. 
judges, judicial supporting staff, and administrative staff. The scale of the judges is limited. While the numbers and the percentages of judges, judicial supporting staff, and administrative staff are scientifically defined. Therefore, judges can be released from massive routine work and spend more time on adjudicating work. Besides, judges of course at a higher level shall be selected from judges of course at a low, lower level in order to ensure that the judges of course at a higher level have enough sophisticated judicial experience equivalent to the trial level. Second is to reform the judicial responsibility mechanism. That's to let the judge who hears the case decide the case, and to make the judge who decides the case responsible for the decision he made. In past time, in order to ensure trial quality and to unify the adjudication standards, Judges render judgments after review of the president of his court or the presiding judge of the division he works for. However, the practice does not comply with the principle that the court comes with responsibility and does not meet the requirement that the adjudicator sh shall hear the case himself. The new reform addresses this issue. Safeguarding judges to exercise adjudicative power independently will at the same time introduce certain judicial transparency measures to ensure adjudicative power be exercised due to the end properly. Third is to improve judicial staff's position guarantee system. Previously, Chinese, ju Chinese judges were treated as ordinary public servants on the aspects of promotion, wages, and welfare. After the new judicial reform, judges will be subject to a separate staffing and rating system and they will enjoy higher salary and better welfare than ordinary public service. Judges will become more professional and elitist. Fourth is to implement, implement centralizing management of staff, fiscal funds, and assess of the local people's costs. Judges of the local people's costs will all be appointed by the provincial legislature. Budgets of local people's costs will be administered by relevant provincial financial departments. Therefore, the costs will be protected from the interference of local interests and can exercise judicial power more independently. The third part, court development in the age of information, big data, and the internet plus. In recent days, the importance of reform and information building has been deemed as the wings to a bird or the wheels to a vehicle regarding their effort on the court development. The aim of the Chinese court development is to meet the requirement of the information age to actively utilize, utilize new technologies and internet thinking, and to promote modernization of trial system, trial capability, and court administration ability. As an infrastructure project, information technology was first used by Chinese court in trial proceeding management. As long as a case is filed with a court, relevant information will be transmitted to the trial proceeding management system in computer. The case information will be recorded and saved 
at every step during the whole trial process. The Supreme People's Court has access to the information of every case, every court at any time, and has set up massive database. The database can be used for trial data statistics and analysis. It can be used for trial quality and efficiency review. It can also be used for judicial openness and public supervision. As the age of internet class is coming, modern information technologies have been more widely used in China's Chinese course. Take the course in Shanghai as an example. We, did, we dedicate to build intelligent, internet-based, open and movable course with the help of the internet. Some of the functions have already been achieved. The first one, internet class litigation. Shanghai course have established a litigation service platform named after its hotline number 12368. The platform can be accessed through phone calls, text messages, faxes, WeChat, emails, SAPP, and website. It shares information with the trial proceeding management system. Therefore, litigants can, can conduct online case filing and have access to case information via the 12368 platform. The second one, Internet Class Remote Trial. In Shanghai Calls, every trial shall be audio and video recorded. The recordings will be kept on disks and failed. When a litigant, litigant, when a litigant resides outside Shanghai, we can use the remote trial system and HD video conference system to carry out remote mediation or trial. Shanghai American Court has also independently developed a portable device system named Movable Courtroom. When the system connects to the internet, it can transfer and transmit digits with the call to form a digital movable courtroom. Therefore, cases can be heard outside the court. The third one, internet class judicial openness. Based on the request of the Supreme People's Court, valid legal documents Random after January 2014 must be published on the website of Judicial Opinions of Shanghai of China. The Supreme People's Court started using APP software of China Post Mobile TV earlier this year, publishing trial information of the course nationwide. Shanghai Shanghai Calls also selected some trials of technical cases or cases which draw high attention from the public for live broadcast on the internet, TV, or other media platform on a regular basis. The fourth, internet class judgment enforcement, relying upon national Court Enforcement Information Administration System, the National Online Enforcement Surveillance System, and the Enforcement Administration System of Shanghai Courts. Bank Accounts, Business Registration, Real Estate, Securities Court, and the other information of a party subject to the enforcement can be reached online, and the bank accounts can be frozen online through the internet protocol. Parties' refusal of performing valid judgments will be marked in the social credit system, 
Shanghammer can put less on the internet resource and tracks and rights ship efficiently. The court also carries out ship auctions on the internet. On one hand, com compared to a traditional on-site auction, um, an online ship auction attracts more bidders and makes the buy the price more likely to be close to the real market price. On the other hand, online auction ensures the auction to be more open, fair, and equal. The last part, specialized judiciary practice and its innovation. In 2009, the State Council released an opinion on implementation of promotion for the construction of an international financial center and the international ocean shipping center in Shanghai. After years of effort, effort Shanghai has achieved great de development on the capability of attracting and uniting financial and shipping elements. The improvement of financial and shipping industry, the increase of scale of financial and shipping transactions, and the extent of internationality, internationalization, accompanied with various financial and shipping innovations and massive transactions. More disputes inevitably appear. Under such circumstances, it becomes necessary and urgent to strengthen the justice on financial and shipping aspects. After the implementation of promotion for construction of an international financial and ocean shipping center in Shanghai, the State Council established China Polite Free Trade Zone in Shanghai in separate 2013. The Free Trade Zone has adopted a series of testing measures regarding investment, trade, finance, shipping, and even government function. The emergency of new industrial tests new legal relationships and new transaction methods has brought about new judicial problems. The advocacy of the free trade zone and the establishment of an international market-oriented and rule-of-law business environment has raised new requirements for judiciary. To better respond to the new judicial judicial issues. We need more professional judicial organs, more sophisticated judges, and more targeted and adaptive legal rules, judicial rules, and trial rules. In Shanghai, the free trade zone is located in the administrative area of Pudong area. So Pudong new area people's court has established a free trade zone tribunal and the guidance of the High People's Court of Shanghai. In April, Shanghai American Court established a free trade zone tribunal as well, clearing shipping disputes relating to the free trade zone, including disputes to which a party is, is a free trade zone resist, resisted enterprise. Disputes occur in the geography area of the free trade zone and disputes relating to a special regulations of the free trade zone. Until the end of August 248 cases have been filed in the free trade zone tribunal of Shanghai American Court. Today, one of our delegation members, Ms. Jin Xiaofeng, is the director of the Dispatch Tribunal of Shanghai American Court in Free Trade Zone 
as his director. That's my introduction. I would like to take this opportunity to invite you, all my friends here, to Shanghai American Court when you come to China. Thank you, Chief Justice, my Huang. Thank you all. Oh, Zhao, 
whether or not she agrees that in principle there is no reason why a dear IFC court judgment can be enforced in any of the Chinese courts.
So far, I haven't heard any your uh, uh, parties apply for any uh, judgment imposed in, in China. Okay, to you, Richard. Well, we'll have to ask one of the lawyers here to make sure that we find a case that we can try to enforce. Yes, yes. <laughs> uh, but if you were to So if uh, someone doing he wanted to apply uh, in China for recognition and enforcement of judgment, uh, would they apply to your old court, number four court, of the Supreme People's Court? Uh, Can 
reserved for arbitration awards for enforcement in China. Because uh, uh, China, of course, is a signatory to the New York Convention. Uh, and then arbitration practitioners know full well uh, the system in, in China that if you go to an outlying port, in other words, not in Beijing and usually not in Shanghai, um, the judges there are not terribly familiar with the convention and sometimes they don't enforce. But again, they are caught by that same procedure that the judge has just described. If you don't want to enforce a, for, a, a foreign arbitration award, which you would otherwise have to under the New York Convention, then you have to report again to the central court in Beijing, and then they will tell you yes or no. If there is a challenge uh, at the enforcement level uh, of an arbitration award and the, the regional court decides that the arbitration agreement is ineffective, it is not a valid arbitration agreement, again, they have to report to the Central Court in Beijing for approval before they make that agreement. Uh, sorry, the lady behind us. Uh, I'm sure Sir Richard will yield to the lady. Is it only in instances where the court is rejecting the application that it gets but the, Supreme the, the reporting system, system comes to play. So they need advance permission, if you like, before they sign off on the decision to uh, deny. But the, so, I'm not sure if this is on. But with the, sorry, it's only a decision to deny the gifts. It's only if they want to deny enforcement or recognition, either of a foreign judgment or of a foreign arbitration award. They have the reporting system. So they wouldn't have to report if they were approving they, they have to report and get approval from uh, the highest court of the issue. Even for approvals, not just for uh, No, if, if they are going to enforce, then they don't need to uh, report. So the reporting is, uh, you know, I, it's a show cause to the high court. I have intended to do this. Is there any reason why I should? So, Richard? In many common law jurisdictions. See if we can get to a mic so that the people behind you can do in many common law jurisdictions, the court will have the power to grant an injunction to restrain a litigating party from taking steps to dissipate or hide his assets. If there is evidence that there is such a risk, and if the claimant has apparently a good case against that party. Does, uh, do the Chinese courts have a similar power to grant injunctions to prevent assets from being hidden away so as not to be available when a judgment is in court?
you know, there, there is such a system. Uh, it, 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 I think we might not uh, try a lot of <laughs> getting details of that. Yeah. Is that my people were bringing another one?
高这个选择合适的这个这个判决，不是没有判决。The, the judge is saying that the, the, the judge is saying that effectively uh, there is a process of selection. Uh, it's, it's not that they first of all they do want to release uh, a large number in the interest of justice because they think that this makes for more open justice. Um, the second thing is that they will uh, have a process of selection. So they don't actually limit themselves to a particular number. Although I think in our conversation she mentioned, for example, that in certain years. But they will not limit, uh, pre-limit that publication. Um, the second thing is that uh, they do have a process of selection so that they uh, publish the cases which have some particular feature of interest, uh, either for the public or for lawyers or for both. Uh, so can I ask uh, if then by doing this, uh, the judgments that are published on the internet can then be used by lawyers to quote to other courts in other cases. Exactly the same knowledge about the law released currently. So these cases has the function to direct uh, the lawyers to deal with the current cases. Actually, what uh, the judge is saying is very interesting because uh, maybe I was feeding this to her to get this response, and I think I got the response that I wanted because in her explanation, she used the word in Chinese, which translated into English is precedent. So I asked her, could you use this quote in another case? And she said, yes, I think this is meant as a guide. And she actually said, yes, because the law is not developed uh, and civil law codes are typically very terse and cannot cover uh, all uh, modern developments uh, in a particular field, particularly uh, commercial, uh, then the precedents are useful to guide the profession. So, Maybe there's a convergence of uh, legal philosophy uh, coming up uh, in, the, in the near future. Uh, and I, I did uh, pull the judge's leg earlier today uh, because I said, yes, this is a very good system, but let me tell you that Taiwan had the same system 20 years ago. They sat down there and they said, what are the top of the pops for the year? And they picked their top 12 cases or whatever the number is and published those. Then they say, these are binding. 
So let me ask the judge itself. So when these cases of the internet uh, are published, um, and the lawyers refer to these cases in a subsequent case, uh, is it the, are the old cases, if they are decided by the Supreme Court, People's Court, considered to be binding on the lower court? It means the lower court must follow it. So the judge said very clearly uh, that these do not have binding force. Uh, the principle is, uh, just think how to translate, how to translate what he said. Uh, it, is, uh, it has the nature of a guidance uh, in, in terms of precedence uh, because uh, they recognize that all cases are different from the others. So you don't blindly apply a rule from one case into the next case which looks alike. Uh, but it says that it may well be that the court will find that the facts and circumstances of case B are very similar to the facts and circumstances of case A, where there is a uh, guiding uh, decision by the Supreme People's Court, and they then find uh, it of use to uh, refer to the previous decision to guide them. So this is really uh, sounds like a, a primitive form of uh, common law emerging uh, in, a civil, uh, in, in a civil law country. Um, so I think this is a very interesting uh, jurisprudential development. Uh, and again, we talk about the convergence of uh, legal philosophies uh, in this way. I allow a break while I look at my notes. Can I Somebody ask, can ask a question. I think it's fair to say that our agenda timings are not binding, but they are useful guidance. And so perhaps we might want to, uh, if there is one more question um, from the audience, from Richard, let's ask that and then perhaps we should wrap up. I was just gonna suggest that the word you may be looking for is persuasive. Because in the UAE, the non-DIFC courts, and every judgment can be persuasive, particularly if it's a higher court judgment on the lower courts, but it's not binding. And it, it may be that persuasive is the word we're looking for here.就是讲指导性的这种案子 Yes, we can, we can consider as persuasive but not binding force cases. Because uh, China is a civil law country. So only the current status has the binding force, it's not the cases. Uh, 
呃，在在中国法院很多审理的案件过程中，一些很新颖的案件、很新类型的案件，那么它是作为一个补充，对于成文法其实一个补充它的案例。很多我们出来的就是这些这个典型性案例呢，都是说在法律没有完全不能完全规范这个这个案件的情况下。我们有一些，呃，带有法官自己理解的判断在里边的这些案例，可能会上网公布，呃，也有可能是适用法律方面，这个适用法律方面一些很典型的案例，也两种可能都会有。Okay, this case is only、uh, be considered as the direction when the current status there's no、uh, a regulation on such situation and. These cases can be considered the direction. Well, thank you very much all for first of all your attendance, and secondly your active participation in the Q and A session, which I think has been lively, stimulating, and for myself at least very informative.、Uh, and it only remains for me, on your behalf, to thank Senior Judge Zhao. Uh, and her colleagues from Shanghai、uh, for honouring us with this visit and agreeing to give this lecture for us. So I'll ask you to thank her in the usual way. Except finally, thank you very much to David. Thank you very much to Hajo and everyone who's put so much effort into putting this on this evening. Thank you to each and every one of you for coming along. I hope you found it interesting and useful. That you learnt a lot. I certainly learned that the Chief Justice speaks much better Chinese than I thought, and that、uh, President Zhao speaks much better English than I thought. But thank you, everybody, for coming, and see you soon.